Good morning, friends. We're blessed to see you and welcome into the life of Sycamore Church this morning. Thank you for your presence because you bring strength and encouragement to others. And we greet those who are joining us online. That's also a unique opportunity for you to remember sometime when you're not able to be here. Please use the friendship pads. It's a way of helping us better appreciate and know who has been with us on any given morning. We'd like to take a few minutes to highlight for you a couple of things in our life and work. Remembering that Christmas Eve services will be at 4 p.m. for a family service, which includes candle lighting and traditional services at 7 and 9 p.m., which are also candle lighting services. Tomorrow evening, if you possibly can, you'll want to enjoy the special talent of Michael Chertok and friends. Uh, this not only is a unique and wondrous Christmas concert, it is a benefit for the Center for Respite Care that provides a healing place for persons in our community who are homeless and who have just been released from the hospital. So a free will offering will be received tomorrow night, 7 p.m. We also are a community which is one that embraces sorrow and experiences of loss. And we want to acknowledge uh, that really there have been four deaths in the life of our church family. Services took place on Friday for Wade Bowman, an especially colorful member of our church family in spirit. There was a service yesterday uh, at First Presbyterian Church in Venice, Florida for Dick Daniel, who's been a 50-year member of this church family. There'll be services this Friday at 11 a.m. for Lori Abrams, who is the daughter of Judy Abrams. And we learned yesterday of the death of a former member of your church staff, Reverend Paul Reinhart. Paul's services will be on Thursday at 11 a.m. with visitation beginning at 10 a.m. We lift up prayers of comfort for all of these families and are grateful for the support of this congregation, which in so very many ways extends love and strength during these times of loss. Before we have a unique video which will give you an opportunity to serve as you leave here today by grabbing something, uh, we have an opportunity to participate in uh, divorce care in a variety of ways, and Tim McQuaid will share that with us. There's an informational meeting uh, uh, following the worship service. Uh, it'll be in the media center about divorce care. We, we've done one round of divorce care. The same uh, individuals who produce uh, grief share also uh, produce this program. Excellent program. We have people already signing up online to be participants of the program. Uh, so there's two things about this informational meeting. One, if you go, you're not necessarily volunteering to be part of the team. You may want to, to go to find out more about the program. You may be interested in volunteering, and we'd certainly welcome that, but uh, encourage you to be in the media center following our worship service. Short meeting, short meeting. Um, the second, that if you do volunteer uh, to be part of the team that presents this to individuals, you're only volunteering for 13 weeks. Uh, you're not volunteering to do this the rest of your life which sometimes happens in churches. There's no end point. So 13 weeks, that's what you'd be committing to to help uh, with this program. So uh, we'll be, uh, after some greeting following the worship service, uh, I'll be in the uh, media center to answer any questions you might have concerning the divorce care. Excellent program.
As we share in the lighting of our Advent wreath, we thank Lisa Wade for helping. Longing for a day when all disaster is gone and no one is outcast. We light this candle of joy in anticipation of God's love renewed in us. Presbyterian, but all I want to say is amen. Join me in the call to worship, please. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. For God's word became flesh and lived among us. Let us worship God.
time of year reminds us that we can never be afraid to go to God with confession, that nothing in our lives is beyond the reach of his mercy, his grace, and forgiveness. So with that in mind, together let us pray the prayer of confession. God of strength and might, we proclaim the Lord is near, yet we fret over our destiny, clutching your good gifts anxiously, afraid to share those gifts with others. Forgive us for living as though you are not among us, and your good promises mean nothing. Renew us with your Spirit's fire, that we may bear good fruit of justice, mercy, peace, and gladness, embodying your good news to all through our Savior, Christ the Lord. Amen. Let us continue with a moment of silent confession. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. Jesus Our scripture lesson this morning comes to us from the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verses 29 to 34. Hear God's word as I share it with you. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one I meant when I said, A man comes, who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but the reason I came baptizing with water was that he might be revealed to Israel. Then John gave this testimony. I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him. And I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water told me, the man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. I have seen and I testify that this is God's chosen one. The word of the Lord.
Friends, will you please pray with me? O oh, living and loving Lamb of God, give us hearts to adore you and to share you. For we ask it to the glory of your loving name. Amen. Every name of Jesus, every title of Jesus is intended to show us something wonderful about the Lord of life. Today we're looking at Lamb of God. Last week it was Son of Mary. Before that, Emmanuel and Counselor and captain of our salvation and the first week was chief cornerstone sometimes we are not sure what to do with the image of the lamb it may not be depicting our favorite animal many times lambs are regarded as not being the brightest bulbs on the planet of being rather weak and ineffectual and vulnerable the reality is lambs are darn sweet they rarely will bite you they are regarded as having intelligence just a little less than a pig and we know that's pretty good if in fact they are threatened they don't want to deal with it they'll run smart and if they're cornered they will butt you with their head not all bad so we look at the idea of the lamb of god we know how lambs are often represented in our society you will not find a sports team named the lambs right and I can tell you that with authority because I did a Google search of it <laughs> after all you know if you were playing under the umbrella of being the lambs you know what people would say we're gonna go out and we're gonna slaughter the lambs today you're more likely to hear an image like the mascot of my high school Toledo Rogers class of 1972 we were the Rams we like that that's vigorous those are fighting words so what do we do with a lamb of God Some of you would appreciate knowing that there is actually lamb blood in my veins. My grandmother on my father's side was Jenny Maud Kent, a humble lady, taught grade school in the humble town of Jackson, Ohio. Some of you have been there. But before she was Jenny Maud Kent, she was Jenny Maud Lamb. In fact, we have her father's tool chest in our home. I swear this thing could survive a nuclear blast. Great grandpa Lamb was born around 1870, and it's a reminder of the family tie. It's also a reminder of the importance that lambs can play. You know, in the Old Testament, there was a dedicated practice of sacrifice. And the sacrifice was a sin offering for the willfulness and the waywardness of the people. And one of the ways that you could set things right 
was to offer an animal sacrifice, and typically that would be a lamb. Now, there were other sacrifices that were allowable, but lambs were the most significant sacrifice. In fact, this was so deeply embedded in the life of the Hebrew people that during Passover, it was estimated that approximately 250,000 lambs would be sacrificed. And the people still didn't catch on. You know, you make your sacrifice and you go out and live your life the way you want to live it. Right? I've done my penance. I've done what I'm required to do. Now I go out and have a good time. Well, the problem is that is pretty characteristic of the human species. Last time I checked, it's pretty apparent for me, too. And we reached a point where our ways and God's ways were so far separated that there was nothing we could do to heal the gulf. We were all standing in the need of prayer. It could only be healed from God's side of the conversation. And it would take a supreme sacrifice to cover all of the debt that humanity had laid up. How fitting that it was John the Baptist who would declare in seeing Jesus, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now the Messiah embracing this image of the Lamb, the Lamb and its sacrifice was deeply embedded in the Old Testament. Here's a passage from the prophet Isaiah, which depicts that suffering role that the Messiah will play from Isaiah 53. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. Yet who of his generation protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people, he was punished. Jesus did not have his life taken from him. Jesus laid down his life. Jesus gave up his life. It was not stolen for, from him. He willingly turned it over for your sake and for mine. He would willingly serve and suffer and sacrifice and die so that we would know how far God's love is willing to go to meet us at our point of need and reconnect us to a life of hope. Out of such strength and service and compassion, Jesus gave it up because in his sight we are worth it. And what he has done here, he has done before, and that is he takes a pre-existing image and he fills it with a whole new sense of meaning and purpose. We're not really well acquainted with the Lamb of God type conversations, but in the book of Revelation, the Lamb of God imagery is used at least 29 times. And it communicates far more than just this sense of a helpless lamb being slaughtered. It represents the victory that the Lamb of God has accomplished. 
we read in Revelation chapter 5, Then I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain, standing at the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. The lamb had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits that God, seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Now, we can get lost in the images and in the numbers. Here's what we need to take away from that in a very simple fashion. This lamb with horns depicts always an image of power. A horn is always an image of power in the book of Revelation. And to say seven horns is a number of completeness. Just like the seven days which completed creation, this lamb has complete power to operate with authority. Because we read in Revelation 13 verse 8, all inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast. All whose names have not been written in the Lamb's book of life. The Lamb who was slain from the creation of the world. This Lamb, this Lamb of God is in possession of the book of life because of what this Lamb has accomplished by his own death and resurrection. This is no weakened creature. This is the Lord of all creation who has by his death and resurrection accomplished our salvation. The Lamb of God is not a demure tone. It is filled in a robust way with the life-giving energy of God that has accomplished all that we need. This lamb is sacrificial. I've often thought that those who are willing to sacrifice are the strongest persons we could ever know. Because they remember, ultimately, it's not about them and when our actions are prompted by what God has done to us with such generosity, we become life-giving vessels for our Lord to use. You might find some of this to be maybe a little interesting. I've already mentioned my high school, Toledo Rogers, which actually a year ago played for the state title in basketball. They didn't win, but... They made it to the finals. Well, I was a runner, and my sports were track and cross country, and it was really my intention to win the state two-mile title when I'd be a senior. And I certainly trained like that was a reasonable goal. So much, in fact, my body responded negatively. I became ill and was unable to run track for my final three years. But I still ran cross country, even though my times became accordingly atrocious. Because I sought to be the first four-year letter winner in our school. And I was able to do that. But my senior year, my two-mile times were two minutes slower than when I was a freshman. It was humiliating. My sophomore year, I was elected co-captain because people expected me to be the best runner. My junior and senior years, I remained co-captain, perhaps because people thought I would be the best encourager of my teammates, which I sought to do, since I couldn't lead them by being out in front of the pack. My senior year, I remember sitting in the stands in Columbus when friends who I used to run with won the state mile and the state two mile. A man named Jan Eichem from Bowling Green High School won the mile and Jeff Schnell from Toledo de Vilbus won the two mile. 
And I got to cheer for them. Although there was that part of me that just wished I'd had that opportunity. But it wasn't meant to be. And I learned many things out of that experience. That you have the opportunity to win in a variety of ways. And it's not just about crossing the finish line in front of everybody else. It's who you become in that process. Particularly when things don't go your way. You realize there are other things you can do and be that may have a profound influence. And so I was riveted when I saw this news clip that most of you would not have seen unless you watch the evening news, I think from New Haven, Connecticut. And it seemed to me worthy of sharing because it speaks to what does it mean to sacrifice knowing that there are often untold blessings which flow out of it. All sports championships are going on across the state, and at this year's state cross-country meet, the true winner of the race had nothing to do with having the best time. Sports Edge on the scene host Erica Walker has the story of a touching display of sportsmanship. I sort of felt like she, she didn't feel the rush that I was feeling, and I wanted to help her feel that. Kayla Samuel was nearing the finish at Saturday's cross-country state championship race when she saw Marin Valancourt in front of her, beginning to struggle after overheating and twisting her ankle. I was just trying to like walk it off and just try to finish. Seeing Marin in obvious pain, Kayla was determined to help make that finish happen. You really don't leave anyone behind, even if that is someone that you know or you don't know. Kayla ran to Marin and locked arms with her running arm in arm the rest of the race. I was a little afraid at first because I didn't know like who it was. And then she started encouraging me to finish and she wouldn't leave me. So I thought she was really nice. My goal right then at that moment was just to make sure she finishes in a good position. That's why Kayla let go at the finish line. So Marin could finish one place ahead of her. I did not want her to do that. I wanted her to finish first because like she deserved it more than I did. She could have just passed me like all the other people. And she just decided to stop and help me. Touched by the selfless act, Marin took to social media, hoping to get the chance to thank Kayla. And on Wednesday, it happened. The pair reunited with their families at Achievement First Amistad High School. Both juniors, the girls are already looking forward to next year's meet. I've helped people out before, but I don't think it'll come back to this. And I kind of like it. I hope we keep in touch. <laughs> side by side once again, it seems to be the start of an unbreakable bond. For News 8, I'm Erica Walker. And believe it or not, that was not the first time that Kayla Samuel has done that. She there will come a time when each of us will be out there running the race. And we may be pained to know that we are at the rear of the pack. We may be stumbling along. We may sense that nobody recognizes what we're going through. We may feel without hope, without the strength to continue to move forward, without anyone to encourage us, without any sense that our life matters. And you feel a presence. And someone comes alongside to lock arms with you. To help carry you forward. He locks hearts with you. He locks purpose with you. And he continues to persevere for you and with you and beside you. Until you make it to the finish line. And by the grace of his care even into all eternity such is the sacrificial love of the lamb of god what a savior what a victory pass it on in the name of the father and of the son and of the holy spirit amen
Let us affirm our faith through the Apostles' Creed. Or we could sing another verse. <laughs> Here we go. Now let us affirm our faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Our time of prayer, let me remind you that we have a prayer team who is uh, more than happy to continue to pray with you following the service. Should you feel the need for additional prayers, you may remain in your seat following the service and they'll come to you or come forward and they'll be happy to pray with you following the worship service. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, in this day of worship, we give you thanks that you are always with us. Indeed, this this time of year reminds us that you have come for us, that you had every reason to walk away from us, but instead you came for us in Jesus Christ. And so encourage us, we pray, with this magnificent hope, especially during this very busy time of year. It's easy for us to get sidetracked. It's easy for us to be uh, discouraged with preparations, with all the things that we need to do. And so. We pray that you would remind us, you are with us, and that we are celebrating this great hope of your arrival coming for us. And though many of us are rejoicing, having a difficult time, we are reminded of those in our own family of faith who have suffered loss. Others we may know that this will be the first Christmas without their loved one. So we pray for them. We ask that you would fill them with a strong sense of your presence as you wrap your arms of grace and love around them. Remind them as you remind us that you are walking with them. Please comfort them with your peace and encouragement. There may be other individuals that we are thinking about in this situation who need your grace and care and comfort. Hear us, our silent prayers for those whom we know who need this comfort and grace. Father, each Sunday we take time to pray for those who cannot be with us because they are home recovering or ill or homebound. So please hear our silent prayers for those whom we know also need your healing grace in their lives. God, during this time of prayer, we are also take a moment to pray for the week ahead of us. We only know this present moment in which we live. We know that you hold our lives in your hands, that you see the week ahead of us. There may be challenges that we will be facing. There As we silently pray, about this coming week in our lives, asking for your grace, your wisdom, your guidance. In 
We give you thanks for this, our family of faith, that we can share these prayers, fellowship, worship, communion together as your people. And hear us as together we pray the prayer that your Son and our Savior taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation. But deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And together as God's people, may we continue our worship by presenting to God our tithes and our offerings.
Two things, friends. One is we want to say thank you to Heather for being our guest today and for all your <laughs> gifts. You're invited on a whole lot of levels to remember to share the joy as you go out. The cookies are available for you to take and share, remembering that we are called to live sacrificial lives, and you can do this. Go with joy. Live in faith. Believe that life is good. And if you find it not, help make it so to the glory of God who made us. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship, friendship, and power of the Holy Spirit Lead us forward together each step of the way. Amen.